So good morning, everyone, um, or good afternoon. I'm here with Wolf, uh, our senior data engineer at Stepping Blocks, and we're going to try to walk you through the story. I mean, it's, it's going to be a lot of storytelling this morning, so I hope you all enjoy the story. Um, first, we're going to go uh, for a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. We're going to tell you more about who is Stepping Blocks, what we do. Um, we're going to take you through the data journey that actually the company went through uh, from this inception uh, to now. Uh, and understand better like what prompted us to actually switch away from Spark. Um, we'll actually detail our migration successes and pains of moving from Spark to Dask and talk about the journey since we actually made the initial migration, which was actually August 2021. And finally, the most important part is to actually share some of the tips, the tricks, and the annoyances with, uh, with the audience, all the things we kind of run into and how we can be able to kind of work around them to make this work for us. And finally, we'll just uh, take your questions. So first, who are we, Stepping Blocks? So we build basically data-driven tools for students and institutions. So uh, our clients are universities, nonprofits, students, recruiters, real estate or HR research. What does it mean exactly? That, mean that means that we actually have a suite of tools with various solutions. The first solution we offer is the student platform, which is called what we call Digital Career Counselor. It's for students, career services, and career seekers. So it's actually a platform that is pretty neat, allows people to actually find out uh, if they want to become a data analyst, what are the top skills that they should get, um, if they want to look at the career paths of real people in our, in our database, uh, understand the different employment, the education requirement for that particular career. And it also allows you to do the reverse, to see if I have a degree in English, uh, what, can I, what kind of job can I, can I get, what most people with my degree at my school I've been able to get, so which is really useful for all our students, and um, that's one of our platforms. Number two is actually Grad Insights. So we use the same data, basically, that we provide in the first platform, but we kind of return the tables. Basically, uh, we show this data to universities, mostly institutional research, alumni relation. They basically try to understand what happens to students once they graduate, because a lot of universities, um, they actually rely on surveys to be able to understand where the alumni actually have gone after graduating. And, you know, as you probably know, not many people actually fill out those surveys. So our data enables them to basically understand where did they go after they graduated? Are they successful? There's this big notion in our field in industry that's called student success. A lot of awareness has been brought to this uh, in, a, in the last few years. And our tools are basically designed to basically to help those institution measure student success or measure the success of scholarship of particular programs. And finally, our third line of product is actually people intelligence. So we actually worked on this um, during the pandemic. It actually was an NSF funded project. And here we basically, again, use the same kind of data that we have, but we kind of, uh, an, again, look at a different lens on it. So for employers, recruiters, HR, and analytic consultants, which is to better understand, for example, the range of salary for particular positions, or if you want to try to research people who use a particular tool or a particular skill to better understand where those people are, what are they doing today. That's a basically quick overview of our solution here at Stepping Blocks. Now, what's our process on the data side? Because here we're, talk, we're here to talk about data, right? Um, so we actually have a, a, a pretty uh, nice data acquisition process, which is to basically gather data from anything we can find publicly. Um, any kind of data, so resume data, social data, company data, salary data, you name it, all kind of different of facet of the data that we're interested in. We're trying to build an actual education and workforce analytics system. And all of this kind of gets dumped into a data lake, which is very cheaply on our end, it's just S3, right? This is where all that stuff resides. And then we actually go through this kind of data processing pipeline, um, we have, which is we can be characterized as an ETL process, right? We basically extract the data from all the different sources, we format them, we transform. On the second stage, we actually start to enrich, we deduplicate things that we see are not correct, we clean, we model, so we actually predict, um, make some predictions or do some imputations of things that are missing in the original data. And finally, we actually go through the final stage, which is to automate or an automated QA process, do human validation and certification. So we're kind of confident that we can actually publish our data to our various platforms. The result is over about 130 million profile uh, in our system, just for people actually in the United States, uh, 25 million plus companies and over 7,000 colleges and universities to give you an idea of, of the scale. 
So what has been our data journey at Stepping Blocks? Well, uh, in early years, when the company was actually founded, um, they were using what I call linear SQL, which is basically to run uh, SQL statements one after another against a Postgres database to kind of transform this data. And back in the early days, the data was not only as big as it is today, uh, but still, it took a week to do this. And you were kind of running script after script to mutate the data and incorporate. And it was very painful and, and it was not replicable. Once you were kind of done at the end, since so many uh, update statements had been run on so many tables in your database, uh, you kind of could never go back in time, so to speak. It was very difficult. So that was a process that I saw when I arrived at the company at Stepping Blocks three years ago. And what I first said is, like, guys, this is madness here. This is, this is taking way too long. We, uh, we can do a much better job, first of all, since the data is so large using a distributed computing system, and especially such as Spark. And since all the code was already in SQL, I said, let's just try to market, actually migrate this to Spark SQL. It was actually pretty quick. I think in about a, a month and a half, we were able to move all the legacy ETL process that was SQL-based to Spark. And then over time, we started to add more PySpark code uh, in this ETL to be able to add more models and, and things like that. Now, the processing time by the end of this, um, and we use a Spark, Spark overall for about 18 months, uh, it took about 24 hours still with this process, right? And now where we are today, which is what we're talking about uh, today as well, is you know the, the Dask ETL pipeline. So the same exact pipeline, but this time migrated to Dask which we've been using now for 12 months with Wolf. Our processing time is about six hours. So you can see here, great, great improvements here along the way. So what prompted our migration away from Spark initially, apart from the, the time it was taking to actually process uh, the data, which was 24 hours? Well, the first was actually a skills and team fit because a lot of us actually knew Python very well, um, but we didn't know some of the internals of Spark very well. Um, a lot of the Spark internals are just, you know, run on the JVM, so you get very ugly, um, <coughs> sorry, tracebacks from Spark when something doesn't work, and it's actually not that easy to debug. Uh, you know, you spend a lot of time on Stack Overflow finding out what did I do wrong here, why am I getting this traceback that I can't understand uh, from back from the JVM, and trying to find the actual worker where the the error happened and trying to find the log of that worker so you can go see exactly what's going on there. So it was kind of, you know, it was painful and we wanted to try to maybe uh, use something that was not as difficult to actually debug. The first thing was that it was overkill. I mean, we were realizing that we're launching those clusters on AWS that were just, you know, with hundreds of CPUs at a time and it felt like we we're just using a you know, a gigantic hammer to, to squish an ant, right? It was just way out of size. And as a result of all of this, it was actually expensive. We were spending a lot of money on what we thought was like, there's no way that, why well, are we spending that much money to process this little data here for that particular section? And we also had a kind of a lack of support. Um, you know, at that time, we were using actually Databricks, the vendor, to support Spark. And while their system is actually very nice and feels like a, you know, a luxury car when you walk in uh, compared to the, open source version of Spark, um, the support was actually, again, something that was very expensive. You could get support from Databricks and get some of their best engineers on there, but you had to pay a lot of money. So when Coil came onto our radar at the end of 2020, we said, you know what, maybe there's a better way to do this. And so we gave it a shot. So what happened during this migration? So we went through many stages, like many companies, we did actually the POC for about a month. And after that, we decided, you know, we like it, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's give it a try. Because the, what happened with our previous ETL is that it got so tangled up with all the different stages that we, we had trouble actually managing the actual code base in Spark between this kind of mix of SQL and notebooks and actual PySpark code. It was just, it had come very convoluted. So it was time to clean up. So we decided why not actually take the time to clean up and test on a new framework. And what draw this actually to what well, draws to to desk initially was because it was pure python and we realized a lot of our issues with spark was trying to make our python code run within the spark uh, framework so to speak so some of the first successes were that 90 percent of our code base was ported in a matter of weeks so that was actually one thing that real, made us realize gosh we can actually iterate really fast here it is not that difficult to to, to migrate all of this. It took actually three months to complete it. 
uh, 100% because a couple section of our ETL, um, some of them are kind of trickier. Uh, they were not, they were easy to, to execute on Spark SQL, but um, on Dask, we had to kind of find a way to actually get this done properly. The integration with our MLflow models was also super easy. So MLflow is the open source version actually managed by Databricks that's there to kind of track your uh, machine learning models. So you can publish them, you can track experiments, you can do all this. So it was very nice built in into Databricks. But the good thing is that it was actually very easy to actually use within Dask as well. So I will show you at, at the end of the presentation, we have some a notebook with an example of how we use one of those models. It was very easy. So it actually made it even easier for us to migrate. The first thing, which is I think the most important, the team felt empowered. Suddenly they were not fighting the framework as much, uh, they were actually be able. They were spending more on their time on actually writing the code they wanted to write to make the proper transformation and all of this. Also, the ability to run things locally turned out to be a game changer because with Spark, um, it's possible to run Spark locally, but in you know it requires kind of an ex you know a, a pretty powerful machine to do this with any kind of small scale amount of data. And you know it can always be a pain. So, but Dask very easy. Just a conda install, boom, you're in the, you're in, you're ready to go, ready to to write your code and actually see it run on your system. And Wolf will talk about later what actually that allowed us to do, uh, in particular. The speed of the ETL by the time of phase one was already twice as fast as Spark. So we were like in three months, we already cut half of it, the time it takes to process. And we were not super happy with Wolf at that time. We're like, yeah, this was just stitched together. Yeah, it's working, but now we need to kind of clean up after the migration, which is what we did after. Um, the software environment management was actually much improved over Spark. By the time we're, uh, we're finishing with Spark to actually train some particular ML models in Databricks, we actually, I actually had to write my own Docker containers with particular versions of libraries because their runtime over there could not install the proper version in their content management. So a lot of, again, friction points here uh, with Spark that we didn't have with Cole because it was, again, the, co the software environment is a Cole environment that you build. It's just as simple. You can also build a Docker environment if you want, but you don't have to. And most of the time, actually, even still to date, we have yet to actually build our own Docker container to run on Cole. We can still use a regular content management. And our time, like I said, was spent optimizing our code, not optimizing for the framework. Now, some of the pains, um, scaling DAS can be sometimes a head scratcher. We, we had some of those moments like, okay, this is, why is this not working? It works fine at this scale locally, but as soon as you try a, a little bit beyond a certain scale, somehow it just doesn't seem to work. The scheduler freezes, we have some issues. And so this is where at that time we're able to rely on the Coil and DAS team to help us. Hey, what are we doing wrong here? Because uh, that's what some of the time it was not clearly obvious. Uh, migrating the Spark SQL code was not fun. Uh, this is going from that to the Dask equivalent was was no picnic. But uh, luckily, uh, it was it was pretty. It was even though it was not fun. It wasn't all that difficult. Like I said, ninety percent of it was migrated very quickly. The rest was trickier. The early coil cluster um, that we la launched, so the the, the facility that Coil has built to build to you know launch clusters at the beginning was somewhat unreliable. Um, so we had was kind of hit or miss when you were running some of them. But the good news is that at the beginning, actually, they were using ECS and it was fast to provision. So we were actually very happy. And if you ask the cool team, we were actually very lazy as developers here to move away from ECS because we were kind of, even though it had plenty of limitations, it was fast to provision. We could get a cluster in less than a minute spun up. Now with a new way to spun up VM cl based clusters on Coiled, you have a lot more flexibility and and you can get more memory and all kind of great stuff, but the cluster takes a bit longer to actually spin, spin up. So, uh, and the other pain is that initially, obviously, since we're core was only available on ECS, we were limited to 30 gig mem per worker. So I did create a challenge for Wolf and I to actually, how do we actually get this to, to run things that we are used on Databricks of, you know, of workers of memory, 64, 128 gig, and certainly we're like constrained to only have 30 gig per worker. So we had to rethink a little bit how we're processing some of those things. Now, some migration metrics. The time frame, it took about three months uh, for two engineers to kind of get the first shot done and be able to rerun ETL from end to end. Um, and we spent about nine months optimizing. Uh, and, and I'm going to say it's not all related to Dask, because like I said, most of our time was actually is now spent on optimizing our code, not actually optimizing for Dask. 
cost-wise, 40% of the previous Spark and Databricks cost. This is after 12 months here looking at what we spent with Scold slash AWS versus Databricks slash AWS cost. Runtime, three times faster, at least. Uh, like I said, we say six hours, it was about 24 hours. So that's, that's about what we've seen here. And also the main thing is that we are not using nearly as many resources on the cloud as a result, which is why the, the cost also is, is lower. Now, the main ETL code base, I wanted to give some kind of idea of what we're talking about here. The, compared to other uh, companies or, or, or teams who have decided to run a Dask in a notebook for all of this, we actually have moved away from notebooks very early on and decided to build a Python module. That was gonna be our ETL. And by doing so, um, we basically are maintaining now this code base as, as like any other Python module code base. So we went from zero to 13,000 line of code, actual, actual code, pure code base in the Python module, 44,000 for the rest of the resources around. So we're talking about tests and things like that, and even notebooks that were helped to prototype some of the code base in about three months. Now, fast forward 12 months since our migration. So nine months later, that was the first migration was completed. We're about 33,000 lines of code in that module and over 239,000 lines overall in the repo, excluding the tests. And this also excludes the other libraries that we use. So one thing that I will talk in a second as well is how easy it is with Dask to extend and add more of your other packages Add when the cluster is provisioned so you can install any latest version of an ML model, for example, on it. So or desk journey since then. Um, I will let Wolf here take over. Yeah, um, you know, I think Sebastian will probably help me approach this, but we want to just kind of go over roughly where we're at now and kind of, you know, kind of generally describe, you know, essentially having migrated, working straight through a desk. So um, I think the first thing to say that's, you know, just important is uh, can't really emphasize enough how helpful the Dask and Coil teams both have been. Um, and uh especially compared to dealing with uh with like databricks um like just I, I don't know if we really would have been able to migrate totally certainly not nearly as quickly uh had they not been there um either in the slack channels or just through you know direct contact for uh questions um we still run into dask bugs now and then um but again to go back to the team uh you know we can recreate tests and either they'll tell us that we screwed up somewhere or uh you know, it'll, someone will get to work on it. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I guess like generally, this is actually probably more of a Sebastian's thing, but, um, you know, dealing with Conda and dealing with like just generally our environments is excellent. Dealing with the way that this, uh, well, actually, I guess I was, sorry, Sebastian, do you want to actually go over these particular parts that you had written in? Cause I, yeah, sure. That's fine. That's fine. So yeah, the, the code for the, the, when Coil first launched, there, were actually, there was no actual Conda uh, library or runtime available directly in Conda to download. But since then, it's actually been added. And it's a frozen version that maintains compatibility with the other libraries, which has been great because if you are following the version and release of Dask, you actually, we've seen ourselves some regressions over time. Like something worked in the version in October, but didn't work in November anymore. Something had kind of not working. So now that they have frozen those in time by testing more carefully, that's been a, a helping solve a lot of headaches on our end. So, uh, it well it goes into the next one, I suppose, which is some issues with quite how rapidly they develop, which is a very good thing, but is part of the uh, the kind of use of that. Yeah. I don't know, if Sebastian, you had any specifics there? No, I think I think that's fine. Yeah. Um. So, uh, generally speaking, um, as Sebastian noted, we've we've chosen to move really everything into these kind of straight Python modules. Um, and it's made iteration a lot faster, um, especially because, so the ability to run all of this locally and test at, at several different scales is like, uh, I mean, it's critical both for just like the reliability of the code, but it's also just made um, actually iterating on that much, much quicker. Um, we tried a few different sort of versions of how we wanted to handle testing. Um, but we really settled on this kind of three stage uh, version. One where most of these modules um, we, that, you know, we have just kind of standard Python testing uh, set up, you know, running through Py uh, PyTest, doing snapshots, um, 
And that allows us to essentially sort of move into, into very rapidly updating these, uh, all of our Python functions and modules without um, you know, breaking anything. The second layer, then we run Dask locally. We have a, a larger kind of group of uh, kind of a, a, a tiny data lake on our computers or just a, a, you know, a small kind of test data that's kind of medium scale compared to the actual PyTest. That allows us to then ensure that it kind of runs at scale. We can have multiple workers going, make sure that nothing's going to break that there. And then finally, we uh, allows us to scale up very easily into, uh, into just running on full data on coiled. Um, beginning, we had kind of a, you know, a, a mid-sized one trying to run it at, um, at scale on coiled, but smaller than our full data. But we kind of realized eventually that that wasn't as useful as we'd hoped it would be. Um, and it mostly just wound up eating you know, a bit of time and cost. Um, this approach also has allowed us to just decompose things down. Um, most of our ETLs just, it's just straight functions, you know what I mean? And it allows us to develop with much more of just kind of a uh, software engineer's mindset for much of these things. Um, we aren't really fighting the framework itself or optimizing for it. We're just, opti we're just trying to write as clean Python code as we can. Um, and that really allows us to also, you know, um, the fact that we aren't tied to this very strict relational structure, um, a lot of our ETL is using Dask bags. Um, there's some parts that just kind of use straight delayed. Um, obviously, we'll use data frames when it fits the task best. But the fact that we can kind of use a structure, you know, a data structure that fits the task itself rather than trying to fit the task to the structure is incredibly freeing and allows us to optimize, optimize our code much better. Um, and, uh, this is also one that Sebastian should probably take because he, he's the one who handles most of our machine learning, but, uh, iterating on these machine learning modules, um, is, is just so much easier <laughs> given that we can run it all locally very, very quickly. Uh, Sebastian, I don't know if you wanted to. Yeah. I mean, the fact that, you know, most ML models rely on Python libraries and all this and with Conda. So again, it just makes it very, very easy. And. And we'll show uh, again at the end here, we have a small a snippet of how easy it is to take your ML model and make it just integrate it into a Dask uh, from the framework to just predict, for example, some something from, from a set of other fields. So yeah, it's, it's been very freeing to be able to just very easily go from, again, from a local ML uh, module to just push it to, to, to Dask and, and get it to, to run very smoothly, so. I figured that we would kind of close here with just giving some general you know, tips, tricks, some issues that we've run into. Um, so as great as these software environments are, um, yeah, they need to be treated with care. I suppose this is almost a more general thing beyond Dask, but especially now that we're no longer working in just like a notebook on Databricks with a very you know strict defined cluster with particular packages on it. Um, it makes it a bit easier to, uh, to mess things up. Um, it's both freeing, but also of course, um, with any sort of freedom, there's a degree of management that comes in. I'll add one more thing here, Wolf, on that one on software environments. The one thing that is, uh, I would say, unique for, for the software environment with Dask and Cool, so that you have to run the same matching environment locally than the one you're running on a cluster, otherwise you run into some incompatibility sometime between version of Pandas or NumPy. And that's the one place that it, we have to kind of freeze on the development side. Okay, we rebuild the environment there, we export exact versions that were built on Coiled, and we do the same locally. So we have exact matching environments. It was, we stumbled a little bit upon it being on a couple of those things, but now we have a really smooth process to take care of that. And I think I recommend for everyone to do this as well. A lot of this will probably depend on obviously um, your kind of data pipeline. Um, uh, a lot of the Databricks version that we were using, as you might imagine, had you know, a lot of it was Spark SQL. So we had a lot of merges going on and manipulations. Um, relatively early on, we, we had issues dealing with that at scale on Dask. And we found that um, we had to be sort of uh, careful with how we were merging, um, as well as uh, started trying to figure out ways that what we were uh, just doing uh, data frame merges on um, or joins. Um, could be could be done better um, in, in Dask uh, by by kind of working around that or figuring out different patterns. Um, as far as partitioning goes, I did notice there was actually a question in the Q and A already on this. Um, that is something that um, 
we have had to work with a lot. Um, we can sort of get more into this in, in the Q&A, but um, the, the defaults around it in general, especially around group buys and dealing with aggregates, is something that you have to watch out for. Um, depending on what you're doing, we have gotten very used to using that split out keyword and trying to optimize those as best we can. But there's not really a one size fits all there. You really have to kind of know your own data. It's a very concrete task to figure out what's going to get you the best speed, the best performance. Um, then that being said, um, divisioning uh, is extremely powerful. Um, and depending on your task, we found that, you know, we can often almost emulate group by applies by instead just setting divisions in the right way and then running map partitions on that. It's a pattern that we've used a fair amount and seems to be very, very performant, at least for our use cases. Um, then for smaller tables that will stay in mem, um, we've actually been doing a lot of essentially just using the uh, get worker and then dealing with the worker data itself um, for these lookup tables as a cache. Um, essentially, you know, one of the great things about Dask is just the sheer flexibility. You really have control over anything, everything. And so we use the worker resources very directly often. Um, things like broadcasting can sometimes actually be, be slow depending on how you're, you know, if you're pulling a very large table from an S3 bucket and it winds up duplicating time or stuff. Um, Cloud can be unreliable. It's not necessarily just <laughs> Coil's fault at all, but you're going to want to put in a lot of defensive, uh, you know, uh, I guess <laughs> defensive programming techniques. It's about, yeah. Um, dealing with retries, a lot of waits. Um, uh, persisting and waiting is something that has become, uh, we've gotten very used to uh, when to do those, um, particularly um, using wait to manage memory because sometimes the workers can uh, get very excited and will, uh, will kill themselves. <laughs> and so getting very used to kind of using, using some of these built-in keywords to, to handle how, um, how worker memory, you know, how they handle tasks and manage their resources. Um, sometimes it's not your code, it's a Dask bug. Uh, so this kind of goes back to one of the first things that, we, uh, that I said about how great the team is. A lot of the time, if you just either file tickets or we create these things and, and ask the team, they're incredibly friendly and very good at, at, at responding. Um, and uh, then this was a specific one that I think Sebastian and I kind of argued <laughs> over, right? in, including, but yeah, uh, Sebastian, would you like to go over? <laughs> yeah, so there's this kind of unique thing in Dask that kind of uh, sets the, the uh, the own, an unknown task duration to a particular value by default. And so if you run some particular task that take a long time to compute, which is like, in my case, a lot of ML models sometimes can take, you know, 100 seconds, 200 seconds, or even longer sometimes to actually produce the result on the partition of a data frame, for example, uh, then then you have this kind of worker stealing that's, that's been kind of maddening from time to time in Dask where suddenly one worker has to say to just steal the work from all the other ones and you're just waiting around for that one worker to slave through uh, this painful backlog of stuff. So using this particular keyword here or that, um, that setting uh, before la launching a task, you can actually bump up the value that you know already the task should take about on your workload and that helps tremendously, again, the performance. And I think that maybe... To wrap up this kind of Dask tips and tricks annoyance slide here is actually, and Wolf will probably agree with me on this one, is that Dask is very much not for the person who wants to just write something and not have to worry about the underlying framework, right? You have to learn how Dask does some of those things. And once you understand how it does this, Dask gives you access to all those tuning parameters, which I haven't seen um, many of the framework provide. There's always some, but Dask really helps to kind of tweak this very nicely. And the result, if you spend the time, a little bit of time to learn how this works, I think in our case, we've seen how powerful, how much more efficient we can get uh, our, our computations done, basically. So I think we're wrapping up here the, the presentation here and uh, we're going to open this up for questions. Thank you, guys. This is awesome. Um, I thought you wanted to share sh share a Jupiter, or did I? Yes, yeah, we have a couple of things we can show. So let me just uh, actually switch back. Give me a second here.
All right, so the first pattern we wanted to, to share because we talked about it, how easy it was to integrate MLflow models. And we wanted to share like a, a, a little snippet of our code for one particular model of how uh, we use basically this map partition uh, on top of a DAS data frame to run against. So we, we map this function predict here. Uh, we pass a couple of parameters and we, re we also set metas for what's going to get returned. And that function here, right here, you can see how we're using that pattern of getting the worker, like uh, Wolf was mentioning earlier, and using the worker data to basically store the result of our model, which is here loaded for MLflow, one of our old models. And by doing so, it makes sure that if the model hasn't been loaded yet, it's going to load it up from using MLflow from S3, the model URI is an S3 URI. And once it's done, it will just go ahead and predict on that data frame that is passed as a part of that map partition. And this has been very, very efficient. So we'll see this pattern often in our code. And like you said, Wolf, as well, when we're trying, not, when it's not just a model, if it's just actually a lookup table or something we have there, we have the exact same pattern. We just load up the lookup table at the beginning when a worker gets called for the first time on that predict function. And then after that, it's able to just uh, reuse it at every other uh, partition call. So that's the one thing we'll need to share. And another one that we, um, we're talking with Wolf actually this morning before the call was a little structure that we actually put together in our own uh, repo. So since we built our own Python module repo, we have built our own tooling. Initially, we actually started to work with Prefect because it was like the de facto of the coiled and desk community. They use Prefect is great, but we kind of ran into some issues with Prefect initially with early integration. It may not still be the case today, but by the time I think some of the issues were fixed, we already had kind of built our own little uh, tooling in our repo, so we kind of never went back, and but we'll need to share how we actually created um, a class that allows us to basically de define a stage, so we can describe what it is. We actually have our own cluster management. We can those clusters are actually loaded from YAML files that can allow us to define how many workers, their their configuration, all of this. So here we have one for Elasticsearch push, which is what we do for, for pushing some auto completes at one point to Elasticsearch, and. We pass actually here the packages, which is um, a function that returns all the packages we need to install once the cluster is actually spin up. Because there is obviously, we build our environments initially with all our libraries that we know are not gonna touch, but for all the ML models and other things like this, we install them every time the cluster launches. So we can make sure we get the latest version of those models anytime we run it. And here the rest is just a very simple, again, with a Elasticsearch Python client to just you know, again, create the index and 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 uh, upload basically the data to to the index. So this is not relevant. The relevant part is this basically this with statement that allows us to kind of manage those clusters with a particular scope. So when this is done here, the cluster closes automatically, and we can move on to the next task. So those are the two little snippets we need to share, and we can add on to that if people have other questions here. I mean, I think a simple way to kind of sum it up is just that the the degree of flexibility with Dask means that we could really create our own tooling. Uh, to meet our use cases within the modules, right? Um, without you know, uh, any without any real headache, it's just like writing, yeah, you know, writing Python. Super helpful. So now we're kind of opening. Um, we have a couple of questions, but guys, feel free to send your questions. We'll just go through them. So Roberto Panay would like to ask, how is your data saved? Which strategies are you using for deciding how to partition data? I think Wolf, you already mentioned something, but um, Am I wrong? No, you're right. I mean, I think, and sometimes I wish I could just give like a simple answer or something. The reality is that um, the way that we partition data is also is often just so dependent on the actual data itself and what we're going to do with it. Um, you know, I, I, I will say that in general, we tend to partition by size just because the efficiency of that works best for us. We will partition by divisions when uh, there is essentially a single field that is particularly important for a stage. But very often it is so spread across fields, like whatever task we'll be doing, that um, the divisions are useful for, for merging, say, um, but they, they will actually be determined by just the sort of size of the partition that we're trying to work with. Um, Sebastian, I don't know if you'd like to. Yeah, I think the, the one thing I'll say is like, in our for our whole process on ETL, I think we repartition many, many, many times. Like it's not like we it's like we repartition at the beginning and we're done. No, it's actually we keep repartitioning at every stage, just again to optimize based on what we're trying to do. So don't be afraid to to do that because I think it, it, even though it takes a bit of time to repartition, the actual benefit and performance to have the right partitioning scheme for the task is gigantic, especially at scale. 
Yeah, that's actually that's actually a very good point because I know I was I was kind of nervous about repartitioning too much uh, in the beginning just because you know it's, it, it can be very costly and whatnot. Um, but I keep learning over and over and and forgetting seemingly that if you don't do it at the right time, you you are going to eat a lot more time. <laughs> that sounds good. Thank you, Oli Crow. He's asking, do you have problems with workers running out of memory then subsequently dying whilst waiting for the cluster to scale up specifically whilst using cluster.adopt? Um, we actually are, are not using uh, a scaling uh, approach yet uh, to our job. We actually run uh, the job with the full load of, of workers from the get-go. Um, we, uh, we have talked about it, but um, we, we kind of have optimized uh, why do you put it this way? It wasn't available until later that code made this available for the auto scaling and be able to scale up and down. Um, and we kind of said, you know what, it's just not worth it over time. We can just probably just keep the same number of workers at full blast. And that's what we're doing. Now, for the out of memory question, yes, I mean, that has happened, right? Many, many times. And usually it's a symptom. If it runs out of memory, it means that you're doing something wrong before that. Like the you are not partitioning correctly or your workers need a little more memory to do the task at hand or, and I think when I mentioned here, the, the configuration on those clusters, we have, I think, dozens of cluster configurations. So don't think that the ETL process runs on one cluster. It runs on a dozen different configuration of cluster sequentially one by one, right? We actually don't keep the same cluster for the, the entire job. Again, we have decided to just make the task run the best. So this, the, the scale, the worker memory, all their specs are different for each stage to be more optimized for the task at hand. Thank you. Max Joseph is asking, can you speak more about pain points with merging data? What are the key considerations that emerged as you work towards solution, e.g. partitioning, et cetera? You want to take that, Wolf? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think in a sense, yeah, part of the issue is that I, I was very general when I said that, but it's also kind of a, a more general issue. Um, sometimes we hit issues with just um, uh, essentially like memory problems, um, especially in the beginning when we were limited to uh, those 30 gig workers. Um, some of our tables are very, very large and it, yeah, it would hit, hit some real problems basically. Um, sometimes I, I think, um, especially recently, what we've tended to find was that um, often when we would use merging as a strategy, um, it is easier to essentially deal with it with the similar kind of worker. Well, yeah, let me rephrase this. We, since we use uh, bags so often, um, just due to the nature of our data, it can be very difficult to get it into um, its most useful form in a data frame for certain stages. Um, very often the pattern that we we'll use is essentially using lookup tables saved as dictionaries and worker memory, um, rat, where, whereas a more traditional structure using a data frame would do a merge or something. We, when we have tried to move away from that, um, we sometimes have hit memory issues or we have just realized that jumping back and forth between them wasn't perform as performant as, as staying in a bag. Um, there are definitely more, I don't know, Sebastian, I'm sure that you could help also with some of these more specific issues that we've had with merging. Um, yeah, emails. I also, yeah, sorry. yeah. I, I was going to say the 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 large data frame merge that uh, that you that you can see happening in Spark almost like seamlessly, where you don't think about it, has to be done with a lot more care with Desk, right? You have to. We learned very early on, like you know, saving your divisions and and make sure all that stuff is proper is proper. But even so, I think I think we, we agree with Wolfer that you know the the large data frame merge. In Desk is still not up to the performance we've seen in Spark, but using um, bags, uh, a different strategy, we'd be able to kind of get around this at least for now. But you know, that's I think that's one thing that uh, I know Wolf and I would like to see the the Desk frameworks to improve so that those large uh, data frame merges are more performant. Yeah. And, it should, and, so, well, it should also be noted that there's also just we are limited by some of what we do in in our uh, pipeline where there are definitely ways that Dask is very optimized, you know, by setting an index and, and, and dealing mm -hmm. with that. But the reality is often we're merging on, on multiple fields or different fields throughout a given stage to the point where that sort of optimization stops being as useful. But That's that right. is optimized for us. 
Yeah. Oli has another question. Are you using Coiled self-hosted or Coiled hosted? If Coiled hosted, are you providing Coiled access to your S3 buckets? How do you find the management around these privacy controls, ingress slash CIDR settings? Um, so yes, we actually have self-hosted. We don't uh, run on cold uh, AWS cluster. We've done it since the beginning, since we first started, and we have basically isolated everything to one AWS sub account, and with you know pretty tight, uh, I would say, uh, permissioning around that, what they can access, what can be written here, and again, making sure your buckets are uh, properly encrypted, you know, at rest as well, having proper life cycles to retire some of the stuff. So it's. It hasn't been of an issue too much for us as long as we stay basically within our own uh, VPC, so to speak, and also having the S3 uh, VPC endpoints as well to, to make sure that all, all that stuff is is properly uh, secured. But yes, that's that's what we do here. And I'll add that we're kind of moving away slowly from Coiled Hosted, and we prefer clients hosting it on AWS, GCP, whatever you guys are using. Um, so hopefully that helps. And I think I missed one question from an anonymous attendee. I didn't know that it's possible, but and I think you already answered that. But what do you use for data orchestration? I think you, uh, yeah, answer that. Is that right? No, actually, we don't. Like, yeah, we we actually don't use any particular data orchestration outside of our own framework. Like, we built this ourselves uh, from the ground up, right? So. One more from uh, Milan Nikolic, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering uh, your name. Uh, if you are at the beginning of a journey, of a learning journey, and trying to get into the data engineering profession, please comment on how one could view PySpark, Spark, Databricks versus Dascold Stacks. Python is my language of choice. This is a wonderful question, isn't it? I think uh, there's a mm. lot of uh, comments around that. So, um... So the first the, the first answer is that Spark and Databricks are um, we have to look at a product around big data processing that is just very mature and has hundreds of features, right? That's the one thing that when you start to use Databricks, you can do crazy things that that everything you can think of, somebody has implemented that feature, and it's very useful, I think. Um, in much larger corporation, when you have obviously data sources of very different sources together, different types, and people are trying to make sense of bringing those things together, I think Databricks and Spark are, are really, you know, good at this because they can empower people to find the data somewhere in the organization and find a way to process it. And in that, and I would say also in that case, the access to be able to access uh, to process the data or query it or generate aggregates or reports or proof of concept or analysis is more important than the efficiency of the computation, right? It is more important to empower the thousands of employees as a large corporation than just to save a few thousand bucks a month on, on the hosting bill, right? So that I think CS Databricks, this is what they're going for, right? This is the prime use case of this. If you have large organizations, obviously, um, that's the way to empower more employees than NoSQL or Python or whatever language you can run on top of Spark. I think that's the one thing that's nice. And also the fact that they have this unified tungsten optimization engine that just compiles back down and tries to optimize the, the computation. So that's that's clear. However, Dask and Coiled, um, on that end, if you're if if your interest in more is more about well the optimization and, and you don't need to have access to all those other features of Spark and what Databricks provide. I think uh, you will find yourself uh, a, lot, a lot happier. Actually, we have on our end, definitely, uh, because we can actually uh, not have to fight whatever the way Spark has decided that we should be processing this data. It's a lot more Pythonic. So if you come with a Python background and you're trying to do this, you will find yourself a lot happier, I think, because like, like Wolf said, most of our ETL is just a series of functions that we can get to optimize. We can test, you need tests, we have snapshot, we can make, verify exactly that they do what they're supposed to. And this is more important to us than just having access to all the other bells and whistles. Uh, so yeah. I think that that would be, be my answer on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd just like to add on to that, especially if you're sort of, um, you know, starting, you want to be a data engineer. You know, there is a way just Spark is so mature, and it, you know, that, you know, my suspicion is that if you want to apply for data engineer jobs or whatever, it's always good to have on your resume or whatnot, right? But in terms of really learning something, um, my, my personal feel having, 
you know, use both is basically one of the things that's great about Dask is that, you know, I mean, one is always learning, right? When you're programming and I feel like with Dask, you, the Dask and Coil kind of ecosystem, you are learning more Python, whereas with a lot of the Spark ecosystem, you're learning more Spark, if that makes sense. Um, so there's something much more generalizable, I think, about what you would be learning from, from using Dask and Coil. Thank you. What a what a great question. I think Sebastian, you said you you guys are looking for some <laughs> for some help. So it's a wonderful. Um... Yes. Yeah. We actually started to advertise just yesterday. We opened up a new data engineering position. So if you like what you heard today, would like to join the team and want go work more on Dask, uh, play, just please apply on the website steppingblocks.com. Yeah. So, Mayank Sony is asking, have you tried data streaming in Dask? We have not yet, but this is actually something that we have just talked with Wolfir. That will be our next frontier here. We're going to try to transform our ETL process, which is right now a batch that runs twice a quarter to actually start to stream our data by the end of the year. So that will be our next our next journey here and uh, to see how that goes. <laughs> we'll, we'll, update. <laughs> we'll update, yes. Yeah, I, I think we're very, we're very excited, but we wanted to make sure that everything was kind of, you know, safe and secure before we uh, broke it all again. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, guys, I think this was awesome. If anybody has more questions, of course, um, Sebastian and Wolf are here um, and can be contacted um, anytime uh, or just, you know, directly on LinkedIn. I'm sure you guys are will be happy to um, share and we'll send their recording. So again, thank you so much for sharing so much information with our community, the good, bad and the ugly. We always like to hear everything. Um, and that's it. All right. Well, thank you very much for having us. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.